We've explored imploding pig heads, taken a crash course in Boyle's Law, and done a bunch of our own investigative work. If this video hits a thousand likes, I'll buy a steel drum just for you guys so we can simulate an implosion. So subscribe to stay updated on that. What's up guys? Welcome back to SSP Diving. I'm a commercial diver with thousands of dives. I've explored places like Papua New Guinea and been on Discovery Channel. This tragedy really hits close to home for all of us in the marine industry. Now just to be clear, I'm just a commercial diver. One of these guys on this t-shirt here turning wrenches and swinging hammers not an engineer we do experience the subsea conditions pretty much on a daily basis we also do a lot of underwater inspections so we often have to put on our investigator hat and try to figure out what went wrong present our findings in a report and present that to an engineer with all that out of the way let's dive into today's topics so i want to go back and revisit the debris field because we now have an updated layout, which makes things a little bit easier to visualize. After going through the NTSB reports, we're now more familiar with the design of the Ocean Gate Titan. I do want to cover some other submersibles and even atmospheric suits and just kind of familiarize everyone with the other designs and why why there was so many issues with this one and why this one received so many warnings from others in the industry. So a lot of folks were wondering why the debris field was so close together, why everything was all grouped together. Well, it was a, it, there's actually quite a large debris field, so we're going to look over that. They have St. John's Lighthouse marked. St. John's, Newfoundland, is the port where the Ocean Gate Titan left out of on its voyage over to the Titanic. So they provided us with two maps for, de for de the debris field. So this one shows the debris field from a bird's eye view that's a little bit further out just so we can get an idea of the magnitude of the area that we're dealing with here. So they listed the measurements down here at the bottom. So this is 500 meters down here. So this actually is a pretty large area. And the reason why it's such a large area is because the Ocean Gate Titan likely imploded mid water. Okay, so to give us some perspective, we have to go back and look at this US Coast Guard presentation that 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 they provided for us that had all all the communications and it pretty much gave gave us a great visual aid of the dive going down and when they lost communications. That's going to give us a good idea for this debris field and why everything is actually spread out even though in the footage it actually looks like it's close together. So this is the video summarizing the events of the Ocean Gate Titan from the time that it left port out in Newfoundland. The Ocean Gate Titan uses essentially just short form text messages, little acronyms that they send back and forth. So, so there's actually not a whole lot to go over here. The Ocean Gate Titan is just being towed behind the Polar Prince. If you guys remember, it's being towed on that large system. They begin their dive at about 9.20 a.m. and have some communication breakdowns. Not really worth noting in this video. We're going to start at the implosion. So the Titan drops its weights at 3,346 meters. That's about the pressure of 4,900 PSI per square inch. That's the last transmission that the Ocean gate titan sent to the polar prince that's the last time we heard from them at approximately 10 47 a.m on june 18th 2023 communications and tracking from the submersible titan to the polar prince was lost so the titanic sits in 4,000 meters of water about 12,500 feet well the titan imploded about 654 meters above the titanic which is a difference of about 2,100 feet. So it's about half a mile above the Titanic is where it imploded. It's going to appear through like the pictures and the ROV footage that it actually imploded close to the seafloor because everything's so close together. That's not the case, and I'm going to show you why. So this is a really good implosion simulation from Atomic Marvel, his YouTube channel. I'll leave that linked below. But this is the implosion here in slow motion. Now we've looked at numerous implosions, right? And we might be doing our own soon, but, but I want you guys to pay attention to these dome end caps. So those dome end caps, those weigh 3,500 pounds. In addition to that, even though this is about a half a mile above the sea floor, these have nowhere to go but straight down. And they're so heavy and they're nice and round. They're, so, they're nice and round and streamlined that they're just going to go straight down. So I've done a lot of search and recovery throughout my dive career. And anything like this would end up orienting 
straight down. So I just have a, just a simple battery as an example. So everything in water is going to act the same, right? But so if this battery fell, so if I dropped this battery in 100 feet of water, it would, this is what it would do. It would orient, it would orient down like this and it would just go straight down. You see how streamlined this is? So it's, so that's a bit exaggerated, but it's going to be the exact same, uh, but it's going to be the exact same idea here with these with these uh, end caps. So when we're looking at that uh, rear end cap that has all the holes shoved inside of it, well, if you can if you can just uh, visualize that end cap actually going straight down, that's essentially what it did. Everything got shoved into that end, and then it went straight down. Okay, so I can't believe I actually found a clip of this online, but this is essentially what I'm. This is what I'm talking about right here. This is a perfect illustration. So. In water, what happened is that the end dome, this is the end dome with all the pieces of the hole shoved in it, and it fell straight down. And then, once it fell, it leaned over. That's exactly what happened. Remote, for example, which is a little bit more flat. This thing in water, it's flat and it's light, so it... So it'll, so it'll kind of like catch the water and go down and go separate ways. So something with flat characteristics, something that's lighter, if we were to drop this, this could end up 100 feet away if we drop this 100 feet of water versus, versus this battery right here, I can guarantee you it's going to go straight down. So let's just keep those characteristics in mind when we look at the debris field. This is slow-mo, just to give you guys an, an idea here. And I think this is actually pretty accurate. So you can see the tail cone. It's showing the tail cone got split, but... We know that it didn't, right? That stuff stuck together. But as far as everything else goes here, I think this is pretty accurate. You can see all the debris, all this fairing material, all these lighter sections here, all these little pieces of debris are going to get scattered. Okay, and so we can actually see that here. So we got 500 meters. So we got 500 meters right here. So this is all approximately within 500 meters of the bow of the Titanic. Now, also, the Titanic is split into two sections, right? We know that. So for, so, for reference here, here's the Titan debris field, okay? And this is the Titanic bow segment right here. And this is the, the shipwreck right here. So we, we can kind of get a better understanding of, of where the incident happened versus, versus where the Titanic rests down here. Okay, so now the end caps. So here's one of the titanium rings. Here is one of the end caps. And now we have a small field of we have a small field of debris. The thrust the thruster, the general field debris is going to be right here. So all of that heavy material actually stayed relatively close together. It was approximately what was that? We would say that's not too far off. We look right here down at the chart. This is only about 50 meters apart. So like I said, anything that's heavy and also it's got kind of that streamline to it, that streamlined shape, that big dome is not going to do this underwater. It's so heavy, it's just going to go straight down and it's got that round end that in water it's just going to react, it's going to react like that. So I just I know that from the hundreds of search and recovery dives I've had to do throughout my career. Um, now I can't, now we can't say the same for the rest of this debris here, smaller debris, the thruster and drop weight tray made it all the way over here. So now, so now the other, so now the other thing I want to point out here is when they did find the debris field, it could have been anywhere. They could have landed straight on it. And most likely they started off here on one side and we call it just, we call it mowing the lawn. You're going back and forth between coordinates and you're searching until you run into something. So that's likely one search method that they used. And then once they once they ran into the first thing, they keep going and everything is relatively close to relatively close to each other. There's also pretty good visibility at the bottom. So with those powerful lights, even though it's dark, you can see quite a ways out. So when they just mow the lawn, they just keep running into more and more here. And then they just go ahead and map it out. Now, the area that they searched is going to be much larger than this, right? So they likely searched this entire area here as well. 
and searched over by the Titanic. Um, with this, you can't tell much. It doesn't give you a good idea. So I'm going to give you a. I'm going to show you a photo that's going to give you a better, uh, a better view here of the debris field layout. Okay, so this is actually a photo that I saw on Reddit the other day. I don't go on there often, but for some reason they sent me a notification, and so they actually uh, marked everything out here with lines. So they took that map and marked everything out with lines here, so you can actually see the important structures. So the this is the Titan's last known position. This is the center of that red circle, and this is the rear tail cone. It was right here, so it was actually pretty close to where the implosion took place. Again, the tail cone, um, the tail cone, I would have to think about those characteristics of that. I think that there's a lot of weight in the tail cone, so that's probably why that also went straight down. It's also got that white fairing material around it, um, that sort of that sort of shell, which is sort of streamlined. So I can imagine that the that the tail cone was just go straight down as well. And here we can see the the titanium dome the rear titanium dome, the rear titanium ring, the the pressure hole, the majority of that pressure hole is right here. The other titanium ring and titanium dome. So these were all very close to close together. And we know that from the ROV footage, but just to just to give you guys an idea, when this is 2000 feet, when the implosion took place 2000 feet below, stuff will still just go to the bottom. So as long as there's no strong currents at the bottom of the ocean, in that location every everything is just going to go straight down and then yeah so there's a 24 inch debris with light there's a thruster skid structure so the bottom skid structure thruster and drop weight tray made it all the way over there the tray the, the tray was actually probably pretty light um and we would have to look at see if they have any photos of that but that can those things can also take off sideways if it's a relatively light piece of metal and it just and it hits the water at just the right angle those can certainly take off sideways here's a skid structure and steel banding over here more of it there's more metal strapping more skid structure the skid structure had to be pretty light then so if you guys look closely here this monitor is still fairly intact for being in an implosion but this monitor was mounted right here we believe so so now to everyone with the questions regarding why was this why was everything so close I hope that helped give you a better understanding I still want to go through and just further examine some of these photos and I do have a couple questions that I don't have answers for so if you can help out with those that would be great please leave a comment now um, so we know that the forward dome and the aft segment here where these are going to be close together we know that these things are these things are heavy and they're somewhat streamlined they're just going to go straight down so that that implosion happened and they go straight down together and when it landed here you could see this imprint that it left in the ocean floor so so you can imagine the amount of weight and the amount of force that was landing there on the on the bottom so we could see how everything's laying down down here we could see that this is the flange. Remember, we went through that in the last video. This flange got just sheared off, essentially. It just ripped off. You could see the other the other side of it right there. That's pretty crazy. It's still it's still hard to imagine how much force was behind this implosion. Because we, we just don't see stuff like this. Okay, and, and so here's the tail cone. We know that the tail cone was pretty close, right? We know that the tail cone was pretty close to the other end caps pre-existing separation now this you know what after looking at this again I could see how it just went straight down I mean the the majority of the weight is going to be down here I believe that there were batteries here in the tail cone so it would probably it would probably orient itself so that the batteries are face down and it's so heavy and it has this streamlining fairing material on the sides that yeah, that's just going to go straight down as well. Okay, so now here's what I guys what I want you guys to picture. So, when the implosion happened and the debris made its descent, its free fall down to the bottom of the ocean. This it it was straight up and down so so it didn't it didn't just fall like this. Everything was everything the debris field was rather tight, close together. Within 100 meters was the majority of the debris. So we know that everything went straight down. 
So this, it didn't, it didn't fall down like this and it didn't, it sure didn't fall at an angle like this. This went straight down and then once it landed, the, all the weight of this carbon fiber caused it to lean. Again, we can see here, so you can see again here how much material is, got shoved into this rear end cap, into that rear dome, causing the titanium ring to split from the carbon fiber hole. And I guess it sheared the bolts that were holding this hatch shut, which still, that's, um, it, it's, it's a lot of, it's a crazy amount of force to think about. And again, um, the, if any of you guys are curious here, this, this is actually an O2 cylinder. And once the implosion happened, this happened. The O2 cylinders that were used for the rebreather system imploded instantly as well. So remember the, the O2 cylinders inside, that's for the rebreather that's for their rebreather system. Those are those large green cylinders that you guys will see on the back of welding trucks and the back of gas trucks. So though in in uh, and in hospitals. So they had a couple of those inside there laying down flat on the bottom of the hole. And I mean it just twisted those like nothing, like like Play-Doh. It just treated it. I mean, this is um it's still hard to imagine because I mean this looks like it's a malleable material. The way it's just bent and twisted and contorted. So, and here's here you can actually see another part of that. This is the carbon fibers. Which, wow, look at how much it's just ripped. And then that um, that flange there just got absolutely just ripped off. Makes you really makes you wonder what they were ever thinking going down there and something like this. Okay, again here we can see this rhino liner. I mean, there was a lot of people that were defending the rhino liner. Um, I I still don't think, it, as someone in the marine industry, that it was that it should have been used as a waterproofing material for carbon fiber, um, especially when the carbon fiber hole was supposed to be nine inches thick, and they went to go with five inches. They had warnings from everyone. They had issues during manufacturing. They didn't have an x-ray inspection performed. So you, you take this off. Yes, it's going to protect, uh, or you put this on, this rhino liner on. Yes, it's going to protect the carbon fiber material from abrasion and, and other things, but it's also going to limit the visual inspection. So if you're not gonna do an actual x-ray on it, x-ray inspection periodically, like it should be done, like the American Bureau of Shipping recommends, well, then the next best option is to do a visual inspection, and this limits the visual inspection. And we know that inside of the, and we know that inside of the Titan, they had walled off, which you can remove those, but it doesn't sound like that was really something that Stockton Rush was inclined to do. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what this material is here. Here you can see, actually see some of the glue that was glued to the carbon fiber hole. It looked like it just actually just ripped a lot of that glue off um, is what it looks like to me. Also, I don't know what the impacts of this carbon fiber is gonna do. Um, it's probably not gonna do, it's not gonna probably have much impact on the seafloor, but there's just, it just completely obliterated this thing. I mean, look at all these little pieces that are on the, on the seafloor here, pretty crazy. So now this right here appears, so now this right here is during the salvage operation. And the reason we know that is because this is actually tipped up. So you can actually see this rigging that they have installed back here. So this um, this shackle right here was was already on, on the uh, Titan. That was a lifting point. But you can see that they added rigging to it. So this is, they're getting ready to do a lift here with this. And you can see the other uh, rigging down here at the bottom. Okay, so I was just curious about any of this stuff. If you guys are able to make out what any of these things are here on the side, I mean, this is possible. I don't know if, I don't know what that is, if it's clothing or what. Um, but I do have a question for you guys. You can kind of see it here, but you see these little yellow-ish spots, these little orange and yellow spots right here. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but to me that looks like iron oxidation. So let's go, let's find a better photo. So here's a question that I have for you guys. 
can you see these little orange spots right here? These appear to be rust spots and you can actually sort of see it here in between the layers. So typically in a marine environment with something like this, this would only be caused if there was metal laying on top of this, if it was in contact with something metal. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I wonder what that is right there. But yeah, you can, you can clearly see all these rust spots. It's possible something else was laying on top of this, which caused this. Um, maybe, it, maybe this is specific to carbon fiber, but if there's any carbon fiber experts in, in the chat, anyone that works with it, um, I would be very curious to know what you guys' thoughts are on all these rust spots here. We are, uh, yeah, that's one thing that stood out to me. I haven't seen anyone else mention this. And it kind of boggles my mind. I'm not really sure what these are here. Like I said, I just wanted to look at these a little bit further and see if we could find anything else. So I looked at this photo in our first video, but I missed one key thing here. So this is actually extremely surprising. Look at this. Can you guys tell what that is? Do you guys have any guesses what that might be? Three, two, one. Look close. Does that... What does that look like? So this is a flat screen monitor on the bottom of the ocean that is relatively still intact, believe it or not. Which is pretty insane to think about that it did all this damage to the rest of the submersible. But the, you know, we're talking about all the horrible, all the horrific things that happened inside of that submersible and somehow this flat screen is still is still there. So this is actually, so they're calling this piece D right here. This is piece D from another point of view. And here you can see, this is actually a slightly better image of that monitor. So yeah, you can see the vents there. Um, there's a, I don't know if that is the bracket for it, but looks like that might be the bracket for it right there. But yeah, this is the monitor, so you can see all that. So all this white right here is all just corrosion. That's what all this white is. It's all calcium buildup and corrosion. So um, I'm not sure why there's white here on the carbon fiber. I wonder if this just got somehow some of this material got lodged into the carbon fiber and maybe that's what's causing it. But yeah, yeah, it's a flat screen down there at the bottom of the ocean. Pretty crazy. Now that we've examined the failures that led to the Ocean Gate tragedy, let's examine some of the more successful submersible dives in history. Some of them might not be as recent as you may think. Okay, before we get into submersibles, you guys know this is a diving channel, so I want to go through some cool diving history with you guys. So this is called a gym suit. This is an atmospheric diving suit. So in our first video, we went over Boyle's Law, so you guys know that it's one atmosphere or sea level, the equivalent of sea level inside of the submersibles. That's why they can go down for so long and so deep and not have to do any kind of decompression like divers do. And so when when we're diving, so when we're when we're diving commercially or scuba diving, we have we have a limited amount of bottom time. This with this suit, this essentially provides unlimited bottom time. Now, the weight of this thing is about a thousand pounds. This, this suit is sort of a hybrid between a diver and an ROV. So this suit can go down to, I believe it's 1500 meters. And you can see this big suit, you can imagine what it's like being inside of there, almost like a, almost like a knight in armor, in a sense. These arms, you can see these elbows here. This is really cool. I really like this website. They have some diving, 3D models, but they have uh, they, they just have lots of cool uh, other other 3D models here. But yeah, so anyways, so the so these elbows right here, they're not like they're not like normal elbows. They're not like our elbows. How we can just extend them easily. They more sort of like pivot and rotate like that. It's very very awkward. So I had a dive instructor that dove in one of these suits. And this was his specialty. This is this is the most, this is the type of diving he would do. And so, if you remember those little those little hands on the ROV, well, these here are very similar. 
So we this is so cool. We can actually zoom in. So these here are very very similar. So inside of that, uh, so inside of this arm right here, you've got little thumb screws, and so you can kind of just twist them, and these things will just continue to pinch and pinch and pinch and clamp down. And these actually have a ton of force on them. And an ROV uh, hand or arm has a very simple principle. They are getting more sophisticated now um, and more advanced, but it's the same idea. In what other ways is this similar to a submersible? Well, it's got it's one atmosphere. On his back here, he has a rebreather system. So that's the same thing that they used inside of the submersible. So it's an it's an O2 scrubber. So it takes the carbon dioxide out of the air and it provides fresh oxygen to the diver. Now, if you guys don't know, now many people don't know, in our in our air, in the atmosphere that we breathe, it's actually only 21%. So with a fresh oxygen bottle, these rebreather systems can actually last for quite a long time because they're not just breathing the oxygen, they're breathing the air, and it's taking the CO2 out of the air and giving back uh, just fresh air, which is only 21% oxygen. Now, a, a way that this is gonna be different than the Ocean Gate Titan, well, this guy has to get launched by a crane. So you can see, actually see the shackle right here. So they would rig this guy up. There would be a guy inside of this suit. They would put this helmet on him. They would shut him inside of this suit. And then they would take a, they would take a crane. They would pick him up and set him in the water. And then he's also got, I believe he's also got thrusters in here. So he can, he, this is a, <laughs> this is a prototype Tony Stark Iron Man suit right here. Uh, underwater Tony Stark. This is about as close as we have come, unfortunately. But but I think it's still pretty cool. And here you can see that massive hinge on the front. And this is all acrylic glass. So yeah, pretty cool. Now this is actually so this this model here. They say that they're still working on it. This resembles more of a spacesuit. This is the uh, ADS Atmospheric Diving System 2000. Uh, meaning that it's good for up to 2,000 meters. So I think at a certain point, technology outgrew the demand for these type of suits because you can safely send down an ROV without putting a human life at risk. And this just ended up being too much risk. Essentially, you can just use a, uh, a joystick inside of a nice warm room on top of the dive boat and you can control the ROV. Now the ROV and... So similarly to an ROV, this um, dive suit and the previous one I just showed are going to have umbilicals going back to the surface. What's an umbilical? It has communications, and usually if you are surface applied diving, like commercial diving, it's going to have it's going to have your air backup air, depth gauge, things of that nature. So this is all lights, camera that's getting sent down to him, and they they didn't include that, which is fine but I think this is still pretty cool. And they just have a single piece of glass. And so the way that you get, okay, continuing on our history lesson, this right here, this contraption right here is actually the first submersible to make it to the bottom of the ocean. I mean the bottom, the deep sea challenge expedition. This went to Challenger Deep in 1960, more than 10,000 meters below the ocean surface. So for reference, so surprisingly, there's not a lot of information on the Trieste. Um, a lot of the credit actually goes to James Cameron uh, for because he was tied into the Titanic. As we know, he went to the Titanic. He's been to Challenger Deep on his own. Um, but so here is the Mar Mariana Trench. This is the Mariana Trench. So this is the deepest point in the ocean right here. Deepest point in the ocean. Now this is Challenger Deep, the actual, the deepest, deepest spot. So this is the Mariana Trench, deepest trench, right? This is still the deepest part. Challenger Deep is the deepest point in the ocean. Now, for reference, if if the bottom of Mount Everest started here at Challenger Deep, it would still be about 2,000 meters below sea level. So how crazy is that to think about? So. A lot of us have a hard time just picturing Mount Everest in general, what the magnitude of that would be. But imagine the magnitude of that having essentially the weight 
of Mount Everest on top of you when you're at these depths and at these pressures. So here they actually give um, they actually give credit to Trieste. So the this was the first time it was it this was accomplished was in 1960, and so when they went down there, it was for a good 20 minutes. According according to the two men on board, there was a loud bang. And then they decided to call it. They said, okay, that's good enough. We're going to go back up to the surface. So, but shout out to them um, and in the, in the Navy that was involved there. Uh, we have a lot of us as commercial divers. We pay a lot of respect to NIDU, which is a Navy experimental dive unit. Those folks in the military did all the testing and all the suffering so that we didn't have to. They figured out what the limits are for the human body so that we didn't have to risk ourselves. So we have guidelines to safely work with now. So just to give, um, just to also give a magnitude here. So this is the dive depth of a nuclear submarine, allegedly 244 meters. The deepest recorded scuba dive was at 318 meters. So, you know, a good thousand feet below the surface. That's pretty crazy to be on scuba. Uh, I seen um, some photos of that and he had a bunch of tanks strapped to him. So yeah, pretty crazy at a thousand meters. That will be the last trickle of sunlight, at least here where it's warm blue ocean. I mean, I've been a hundred feet under and it's pitch black down there. <laughs> so, um, 2,500 meters is the deepest diving whale. Now, to put into perspective, the Titanic here, where they failed, was, what was that depth we were looking at? It was more like 3,400 meters, right? It not even They didn't even reach the Titanic when the implosion happened. Challenger Deep is at 10,000 meters, almost 11,000 meters right here. Just shy of 11,000 meters. James Cameron's crazy self was down there for six hours around there scooting around taking pictures and in, in the name of science pretty crazy now he's not the only one that that went there nor are the men uh from the triest so let's look at the design of the triest what do we see here it's a cylinder okay it's a cylinder hmm okay well, why did it survive? Well, actually, because the guys that were inside of it were inside of this little sphere right here. Do you see these little chutes right here? This was their version of a drop weight system. So they would actually fill these guys up with lead, uh, with lead weights, like lead BBs. When they got to the bottom, they would open these chutes. It would let all the lead weight out, and they would just float back up to the surface. Back in the 60s, they didn't have the fancy thrusters or anything like that now this says that it has a guide rope um i did read somewhere that there were some some sort of submersibles that had uh early submersibles that had guide ropes that went down and i'm sure there's some truth to that but i don't think that these guys used these here's a very cool action photo of the trieste when it breaks the surface and the zodiac is rushing over to it to to get the man out of there those are the two guys that were down inside. And this here is just a good close-up photo of that sphere that those two men were in. And here you can see those pellet hoppers right here that they would open up. And this was steel here that they used. It wasn't titanium or, or any of the more uh, modern materials that they're using on submersibles. And they were able to do it safely. Pretty cool piece of history. It also had um, gasoline ballast tanks. And gasoline floats in water, so I believe that they used that for buoyancy rather than than air. Because if they were going to use air to kind of keep things afloat or upright, well, we all know air is going to compress and it's going to implode. So, yeah, so they had lead hoppers for drop weights and they had gasoline for buoyancy back then. Pretty freaking crazy that they were able to do this in the 60s and figure this out. Shout out to them. So that's not the only submersible from the 60s that is still around today and doing work here. So Alvin was actually constructed in 1964. As you guys can see there, it's got a sphere for a hole. Now, over the years, all these parts have been changed and it's actually still diving today. In 1986 is when it reached the Titanic. This was the first submersible to reach the Titanic here. So this, they're just showing here how the design has changed over the years. 
And in, I think it was 2013 is when they actually upgraded that sphere. And this is the current design of Alvin. But it just goes to show that these things can be done safely. And, and the, the methods are tried and true. They have been proven to work. The spheres we know are the strongest shape. And those are not going to crush like a cylinder would. Now these are just some photos here of both the Trieste and Alvin. Now this one I don't know much about, but if you guys want, I can look further into this. I am kind of a Jeep guy myself, so Deep Jeep is kind of a cool name. Um, but yeah, that's a cool little one. That's a cool little design right there, pretty interesting. Oh my gosh, you guys, I just recorded a bunch of stuff and forgot to hit record. So I was talking about James Cameron's uh, Deep Sea Challenger here. Um, so this, uh, so so we're just gonna look at the design. I can't show you guys too much video, okay? I can show you just like a little snippet, but I can't show you much because it's all copyrighted. So as you guys can see here, this is the orientation. So this is the orientation, right? So one of the differences between this design and the and the Titan, well, we know that the the Titan had its horrible Lars launching system pretty much just continued weakening the structure as it's slamming on the waves on its way out to on its way out to sea. We know that the Lars would tip up at times because they can't drain the water properly because it was just a, a poor design, which they were proudly stating that it was patented. In any case, um, I just want to show you guys this here. So the way that they would launch this, this is one of the differences here. They would launch it by boat with the crane so they would launch it off the side of this support vessel this large this huge ship here this big mothership and they have lift bags strapped to the the top of it now these lift bags right here are pretty common these are uh these are either 2000 or 5000 pound lift bags um and there's they have four of them and they have these straps here with quick releases on them and so when they launch this when they launch this and when they recover this They'll, the crane will set this in the water. It'll disconnect. The, the crane will disconnect from the submersible. The submersible will be sitting there, and then they'll pull these straps, in which qu quick releases these lift bags. Then the submersible will orient itself correctly. James, James Cameron's down here in his little sphere. He's got his arms. These, have, uh, these are manipulator arms. They have arms on there so he can, so he can grab stuff, do stuff, take samples. Um, probably take photos. He's got a bunch of cameras rigged on it right here, and I'm sure he's got cameras all right there too. These also have lights on them right here. So there is some material in here, so I have to be careful. I can kind of maybe just show you guys a couple snippets. So this is him getting in and out of the sphere right there. Pretty cool. So look at these thermal vents. So let me know if I get this wrong, but I think it's tectonic, pl tectonic plates meeting each other and then it's creating a crack in the earth's crust and then the all the lava and magma it it allows all the hot water to essentially escape through that crack i think is i think i think that's what's going on but i'm not sure but this is this is uh thousands of degrees of, of boiling water right there so so if you guys haven't seen this movie i highly recommend checking it out you can really get a good idea of the diving operations and how everything works here you know this and any so any underwater mission is going to have its challenges no pun intended but you can certainly limit the uh, amount of issues that may arise so he also had communications with the surface so they had a form of a transducer where they can uh, talk back and forth to the surface even that even this old Trieste back in the day, they had underwater sonar phones, telephones. So they were able to talk back in the sur back to the surface. So this was actually a choice, okay, to just use short form text message, you know, and not not be bothered. It was a it was a cheap way out. And Stockton Rush admitted, you know, pretty much. And Stockton Rush didn't want to be bothered while he's down there. You know, I mean, it's it sounded like this guy just really just was. An absolute maniac he didn't want to be bothered down there you know and I mean I get it I've been to the bottom of the ocean and stuff but this is the Triton submersible limiting factor this is rated to full ocean depth Victor Vescovo reached out to Triton uh, in pursuit of this mission he asked he really liked their subs and wanted them to uh, to build build these this right here is a very cool uh, 
So this this like short documentary here is on YouTube and it's got a lot of cool content, but it really goes over the engineering that went into building this submersible. Now, if I'm going to the bottom of the ocean, this is the type of quality that I want. You know, I want something that I know is fully tested, it's safe. These vehicles are certified as was the uh, deep sea challenger of uh, James Cameron there. And so here with the design is slightly different. They have a, a sphere here in the center and then it's almost like a, um, so here you can see they actually have multiple acrylic windows and they have the thrusters, thrusters on that side there. Um, I can't go too deep into this because man, it's going to take a long time here, but yeah, so here you could really see some of that engineering. There's another look there, man. That is so cool. They actually have not one, not two, but three acrylic windows on this one. And they were actually able to go much further than the Titanic, more than, more than half the, more than twice the depth. So um, this was in uh, 2019 when Victor Vescovo took this down to Challenger Deep at a depth of 10,000 meters. Now, again, this was one of Stockton Rush's complaints is that it's very expensive to have a dedicated support via uh, dedicated support vessel. Well, that's what this is right here. This is the DSSV uh, pressure drop is what they call. Now, these names are pretty cool too. Pressure drop, limiting factor. But anyways, you can see the pretty massive crane over there that they have on the side to launch and recover this uh, submersible. Yeah, that ship is awesome, dude. Look how look how sick that thing is. That's so cool. Yeah, that's that's now that is a ship. Yeah, so there you can see those acrylic viewports. How cool is that? They got three of them in there, and then you can see the lights right here. And uh, I'm sure there's other sensors and things there, but yeah, very cool. This massive arm. Look at this massive arm that's on the side right there. So uh, regarding communications, it says that the limiting factor here used ultra low frequency acoustic communication system to main contact with the surface vessel. So the communication system allowed Victor and his team on the surface to exchange basic information such as updates, nav navigational data and voice communication during the dive. Now all this white stuff right here, so you guys seen that it had the big, um, so, all the, so a lot of this white material here is syntactic foam to help with uh, buoyancy. So here's another look here. Um, it, it's rated to 36,000 feet. It's had a 14,000 meter pressure test. Sorry for the background noise. Two people can fit in the sphere here. Uh, it's got 16 hours plus 96 hours of emergency life support. Remember in those headlines back in, in the news last year when they were saying that, hey, they might have an, enough oxygen for two days? Yeah, this has enough, enough oxygen for 96 hours. So now if you guys want to check this out, this is on 5deeps.com, but it has this little slider right here that allows you to get a peek inside of the design. All right, you guys. This is Triton Submersibles. So these are the guys that built the limiting factor for Victor Vescovo when he went to the bottom of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. These guys make some extremely cool and also safe and classed submersibles. So I guess when you have a lot of money, you can spend some money on stuff like this. Uh, a lot of these are going to be designed for recreation. But I'm going to take you guys through here. We're going to take a little peek at some of their submersibles. Here you can already see one of their smaller, more common subs, you know, subs that you'll see on yachts. But let's um, let's take let's just take a quick look here, okay? So first of all, what do you guys see a difference between these submersibles and the Titan? I mean, these are premium grade, and a lot of these are designed, and they need to look nice for high-profile clients. But these are freaking cool. And here, right here, this is the Triton. 3600 as we know it's rated to full ocean depth 36,000 feet full ocean depth it can go deeper than the deepest point in the ocean that's the type of confidence that that you want when you're getting something built for you so if you look here if you guys want to go take a look on their website so they're actually starting at so so their shallowest ones are between 330 feet and 660 feet is what they are rated for this is the triton deep view this is more for like a very shallow water 
commercial submersible if you want to do tours but i mean look at the quality of this even just the i know this is a rendering but look at the quality and here are some some additional photos of one out in the out in the field that's so cool these things are so cool now yes this this actually has a cylindrical design but the depth that it's rated to is 328 feet so so about a tenth of what ocean gate was trying to accomplish with a similar design this next one right here this is so as they describe it it's a luxurious uh entry level super yacht submersible which is <laughs> which is so cool but yeah so this is a recreational this is their version of a toy this is their version of recreation the titan submersible i i said before that it looked recreational compared to other submersibles but no it actually looked actually looked much worse this if this is recreational then that's what i want yeah super cool how cool is that this is the Triton 660 Ava. Now it's only rated to 660 feet. That's that's one of the problems here. But look at the design on this. You can fit. It says you could fit between six and nine people on these submersibles. This is some top of the line rich stuff right here. And Triton, the and these are all classed by the way. Keep in mind these vessels are all classed. So that this here is just showing. Hey, you can bring people on a tour, have a cocktail bar, you can have a wedding venue, you could use it for a wedding venue, dining, subsea, high rollers. You imagine just millionaires just gambling underwater. <laughs> that's crazy. No, oh, that's so crazy. But yeah, donate to the channel so I can start buying one of these. Hit me with the super thanks so I can afford one of these one day. Okay, the last one that I want to show you guys. So we are going back to the Titanic, or rather Triton is going back to the Titanic. Now, this is going to be the next submersible that visits the Titanic, and they're planning to make that dive, I believe, in 2026. So this is the Triton 4002. Now, you can see how it has those gullwing doors, which is pretty freaking awesome. But I'm going to give you guys a, a better look at the inside. So it says direct direct dive. The Triton 4002 features large vents, a streamlined large profile, and simplified launch procedures, allowing you to spend the bare minimum of time on the surface before diving and getting on with your work. Once subsurface, the submersible's hydrodynamic shape with wings folded speeds the descent to ter to 13,000 feet. The journey takes less than two hours, significantly faster than previously possible. So what they're saying is those, these wings right here, they drop this in the water, and once it begins its descent, it closes those wings, and then it just, it just, just goes straight down. Pretty cool. Silent glide. During ascent and descent, silent glide can be enabled, which allows gentle sweeping turns for perfect cinematic camera work or for, or for following, but not disturbing. That's got to be some rich people talk for creeping up on somebody uh, that you don't want to know is there. Um, oh, invertebrates on the move. Sorry. False alarm. <laughs> Without using thrusters, the Abyssal Explorer... Can maintain a fixed heading, track on an object, or even glide towards a target during ascent. Gold wings coupled with ultra fine grain control, which debuted on our flagship Triton 3300, are also perfect precise move maneuvering, allowing multiple subs to rendezvous to close proximity, or for the close inspection of subsea structures with ultimate confidence. So it sounds like potentially. I think eventually in the future, their goal and what we might see is a fleet of these being taken out at once. Because you can see how they're mentioning how quick it is and how easy it is to get to put this thing in the water and just go straight down. You're talking about underwater rendezvous with other submersibles. So I think that their intentions here is, well, we know that we can't safely bring six people down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it's just not possible. Probably it, even if you had a large sphere, it's probably not safe. At some point, it would that would it would just wouldn't be feasible. So I think what they're talking about is instead of doing Stockton Rush's idea, 
is having multiple of these and and they would be could be working could be uh down there together cool look how cool these things look yeah you know honestly i hope that these make it down to the titanic and we end up seeing some safe and successful missions i think we would all love to see that so here you can kind of get a peek inside this is just a rendering right i haven't seen anything official uh, but you can get a peek inside there's all the switches and look what do we have what do we have hold on hold on i'll show you hold on i'll show you oh look it's a joystick it's a joystick it's not a little bluetooth playstation controller or logitech controller it's a physical joystick and i'm sure that there's even a manual override beyond this that you can use not a little bluetooth controller so yeah, there it looks like, I'm, I'm not sure if that's going to be batteries. I'm sure there's batteries in there. I'm not sure what else is in there. You can see a side thruster there. And here you can get a look at the uh, uh, goal wing doors. Here this is open on the back, but that's obviously going to be closed. And this is what it looks like when the, when the goal wing doors are going to be shut. And it's making its descent um, and, and possibly ascent as well. Uh, on the front here, you can see some very cool uh, ROV arms. I can't wait to see this, man. I hope they bring this thing to life soon. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video half as much as I enjoyed making it for you. I love kind of sharing my passions of the underwater world with people. I didn't know you guys would be so receptive to it. So I thank you all very much. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this content, you know, please support the channel. Just give it a quick like and subscribe. I really appreciate all you guys' support. Like I said, if we hit a thousand likes on this next video, I will buy a steel drum and we will do our own implosion. So I, I don't know. I think that would be I think that would just be interesting to see the magnitude of an implosion with just a barrel. In the next video, I would kind of like to change gears just a little bit. I'm thinking about diving sort of into the mind of Stockton Rush and kind of what his thought process was behind all this and why he wanted to put people's lives at risk like this. Let me know if you guys have any other suggestions for video topics and if you have any other questions. But um, yeah, I hope you guys really enjoyed this. I enjoyed making these for you. So, so thanks again, you guys. SSP Diving out. Dive safe.